This is part one of cold-induced tissue injuries presentation. In this presentation, we will talk about your typical patient that might be at risk of developing frostbite. We will then discuss pathophysiology of cold-induced tissue injuries and some definitions including those of chilled lanes, frost nip, and immersion foot. What is the typical patient you might encounter with frostbite? Historically, it used to be military personnel. Troops in Napoleon's wars often suffered from frostbite. Refugees who are trapped in high altitude areas, like in parts of Kashmir and Afghanistan, are at risk of developing frostbite due to inappropriate clothing and lack of shelter. Most often, you will encounter a civilian population with cold-induced tissue injuries. The undomiciled, intoxicated, or people trapped outdoors in the winter are at risk. Mountaineers and polar explorers frequently fall victim to frostbite as well. Knowing the basics of skin thermoregulation are important to understand how frostbite develops. Your body loses heat by radiative heat loss which increases when blood flow to the skin and extremities increases via vasodilation. This is what happens when you are hot. Your normal blood flow is 200 to 500 mLs per, per minute. When your body is hot at 41 degrees Celsius, this flow increases to 7,000 milliliters per minute. When you're a cold, the vessels to your skin and periphery will basically constrict to limit radiative heat loss. So at body temperature of 15 degrees Celsius, the blood flow is decreased to 20 to 50 mL per minute. This will lead to acral cooling, as can be seen in the figure to the left. And it also traps the heat at the core to keep your vital organs warm and functioning. This is also known as life or limb response. Lack of blood flow and increased cooling to acral structures such as your hands, feet, ears, and nose predisposes these areas to cold-induced tissue injury. Cold-induced vasodilation is a protective reflex against development of frostbite. It is also known as hunting response. Paradoxical peripheral vasodilation occurs at low temperatures every 5 to 10 minutes, allowing blood flow to extremities and their warming. It is the strongest when extremity temperature falls to 10 degrees Celsius. There is considerable individual variations in this reflex. For example, Nordic fishermen and the Inuit have very robust cold-induced vasodilation, and can stay out in the cold without getting tissue injury for longer than the average person. Studies are underway to see if it is possible to acclimatize and develop a stronger cold-induced face isolation with frequent exposure. This graph demonstrates cold-induced face isolation when a finger is immersed in ice water and cooled to 5 degrees Celsius. There are four phases of cold injury to the tissue. These are pre-freeze, freeze-thaw, vascular stasis, and ischemia. The pathophysiology of frostbite is complex. Below are some of the ways that tissue injury occurs. There's direct and indirect cellular damage. Extra and intracellular ice crystal formation occurs. There's also cell dehydration and shrinkage leading to apoptosis of cells. There's abnormal intracellular electrolyte concentration, denaturation of lipid, protein complexes. Eventually, vascular stasis and microvascular injury occurs leading to ischemia and infarct. It is very important to remember that refreezing thawed tissue worsens outcome. So what kind of tissue injuries one can get from the cold? In the next few slides, we will discuss frost nip, frostbite, chilblains, 
and immersion foot. In this photograph, you see frost nip to the nose. Frost nip is a non freezing injury, and uh, there is intense vasoconstriction and uh, ice crystal formation on the surface of the tissue. It is painful and discolored to white, and there is complete resolution within 30 minutes. It is important to note frost nip as it is a precursor to frostbite, a more serious injury. Frostbite is a true freezing injury. Frostbite classification has changed in recent years. It was used to be modeled after the burn classification from first to fourth degrees, from the least to the most damaged to tissue. The new classification is based more on outcome and classifies injuries into two main categories, deep versus superficial. This roughly corresponds to first and second degree injury in traditional classification being superficial and the third and fourth degree being deep. Addition of angiography or technetium scanning can classify the injury more accurately and predicts outcome, but this method is not applicable in the field. Remember, it is often hard to tell initially which class of injury has occurred. Always assume the worst possible injury and initiate conservative treatment. In this photograph, you can see first degree frostbite in the right big toe. It is a superficial injury and there's no tissue damage, although it is a true freezing injury. There is persistent erythema, edema, and numbness. This does not resolve immediately when the patient is rewarmed. In this photograph, you can see second degree frostbite to the tops of the fifth and fourth digits. This is still a superficial frostbite. There is superficial bullae with clear fluid. There is also some surrounding erythema and edema. Usually in this type of injury, this is a third degree frostbite. This is considered to be a deep frostbite. There are deep bullae that are blood filled. There is injury extends to the reticular dermis of the tissue. There is considerable tissue loss in this kind of injury and there is considerable functional sequelae. We will discuss this case further later on in our presentation. This is an example of fourth degree frostbite, also a deep frostbite. There is injury through all of dermis, also to muscle and bone. There is absence of blisters and there is also absence of sensation to the frostbitten area. There are severe, severe sequelae to this injury and uh, it results in amputation of the digits. Next, uh, you can see another schematic showing the extension of cold-induced injury as it is related to skin tissue layers. Chilblains or pernia is another condition that occurs commonly at high altitude and cold and windy environments. It is not a true freezing injury. Chilblains are painful superficial blisters and ulcers that are inflammatory in nature. This condition is not dangerous, but it is a nuisance. This is coming from a person who had them now twice. The treatment of chilblains is uh, to stay out of the cold, steroid cream, and nifedipine. Immersion foot or trench foot is another condition that can be found in cold climates. It's a non-freezing injury and it occurs due to prolonged exposure to cold water. Some nerve damage can occur and the skin will appear mottled and pale and oftentimes tender. Prevention is really to try to keep your feet dry and the treatment is pain control and oftentimes these patients will need evacuation.